Good afternoon, everyone. Maybe good morning for someone. Uh, welcome to already third episode of uh, this webinar series, R&D activities on SCO2 in Europe. Uh, this webinar series is brought to, to you by ETN Global. ETN Global is an international membership association representing the entire gas turbine value chain technology. And my name is Sitka Spolstova and I work for ETN Global as a project officer and I will talk you through this uh, webinar. So if you remember last uh, session, uh, session number two, we started talking about component challenges and then we talked about compressors. So we continue with component challenges and today we will speak about heat exchangers. We decided to split the session of heat exchangers into two. So this one is the first one. Uh, we will speak in particular about recuperators and coolers, and we'll keep the rest for the next time. So this uh, webinar series is supported and organized uh, by uh, the following eight European R&D projects whose logos you see on the screen. We have six EU funded projects and, and two uh, national projects. If you need to find out more about these projects, you can check out the, the, the event website of uh, the in the ETN Global's website via which you probably registered to this webinar. Um, so before we dive into presentations and about uh, and, and in, into the interesting uh, topics because of which you, you came, let me tell you something uh, important so that we all have um, a seamless webinar experience. So as you have probably noticed, uh, this uh, webinar is recorded and after the session you will receive the link to the recording so that you can also maybe share it with your colleagues. Unless you speak, please mute your microphone and switch off your camera. If you have a question, uh, you can keep it for the end because there is a dedicated Q&A session that is planned uh, for the end of the session. But if you like, you can already in any time during this one hour uh, slot, you can write your question in the meeting chat and our speakers will either uh, reply directly or they will keep it for the end. The next point is that you will need your phones, your smartphones, because uh, we have foreseen Slido sessions, so you will need your phone in order that you can uh, take part in these sessions. And the last point is that um, you will receive the presentation that you will see or presentations. We will share them uh, after the, the end uh, of, of this webinar. So unless you really want to, you don't need to take many notes or screenshots. So what are the topics for today? So the first presentation is uh, academic and it will be on fundamentals, challenges and recent research. We will continue by printed circuit heat exchangers presentation and we will conclude today by a uh, topic improvement of dry air cooler for the condensation of blended CO2 using enhanced tubes. However, before we do it, as I said, we have the Slido. So this is the time that you need your phones. I think that most topics that you have just written will be covered in uh, in the presentation that you will see. So this is definitely good news. However, I would like to ask my colleagues if anyone can come with me to um, to the stage to debrief on what we see. If this is something that you expected, or maybe it's uh, surprising for you. So I don't mind. Um saying something on that. Um, as you can see, um, compact is kind of um, very large there alongside like compactness um, and I suppose kind of size um, in this case and the overall kind of um, uh, kind of plant size is quite important here. Uh, people are also looking at high efficiency, effectiveness, um, kind of some of those topics as well, kind of the next size down. Um, and obviously in uh, power generation that uh, efficiency is a very large um, kind of focus here. And then also you've got um, other smaller boxes where we're looking at the high operating pressures, um, high temperatures, um, and these are also kind of related back into that high efficiency effectiveness um, for these cycles where it, those kind of demands cause the higher operating pressures and temperatures. Okay, hey, thank you very much. 
so I think we can conclude um, the Slido. And um, now is the time for the first presentation that uh, is brought to you by uh, Professor Salas Tassou, who is the director of uh, Institute of Energy Futures in, uh, at Brunel University, London. Uh, Savas has over 30 years academic and research experience in the area of thermal and energy engineering, covering heating, cooling and power generation systems, including CO2 refrigeration system and heat pumps, waste heat recovery, heat exchangers and SCO2 heat to power technologies. So I will share the screen. The presentation of Salas. Do you see it? To make sure that you yes, see this yes, one. Yes, yes uh, to, to see it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, Yitka, thanks. Uh, you can enlarge it. Okay, great. Yes. Th thank you, Yitka, for the uh, for the kind uh, introduction. Um, now, what I'm going to be doing really uh, is is giving a kind of an introduction to, to coolers and, uh, and recuperators for SCO2 uh, cycles. Um, not very much on fundamentals. Uh, I mean, the title was very ambitious. And then, of course, once you start putting the slides in, then you discover that you need an hour to do the presentation. So we had to cut out quite, quite a lot. Next slide. OK, a little bit of background. Um, now, um, I'm based at Brunel University London. Uh, uh, Brunel University is um, at the outskirts of London, very close to Heathrow Airport. And as uh, Gitka said uh, earlier, really, we've been working on uh, uh, SCO2 cycles, uh, both uh, theoretical and experimental work uh, over the last uh, few years. Next slide. Uh. Now, um, SCO2 cycles uh, uh, require quite a lot of heat exchangers. If we start from the very basic uh, cycle, we have one cooler, one uh, one heater, uh, and of course a turbine and compressor. If we go to the basic uh, recuperative uh, uh, cycle, then we're going to have a recuperate a recuperator as well. And then if we go into more complex cycles, such as the decompression, then we'll have a uh, a high temperature recuperator and a low temperature recuperator. So, the more complex the cycles, the the more the the higher the number of heat exchangers we need, and uh, the uh, higher the cost. And of course, we want uh, to have the heat exchangers as efficient as possible because not only they they decide the cost, but also the overall efficiency of the system. And um, Heat exchangers represent a large percentage of the total cost of the overall system. Next cycle, please. The next slide, please. Now, um, SCO2 uh, has a very um, um, good uh, thermophysical properties, uh, particularly very close to the uh, critical uh, temperature of 31 uh, degrees and uh, centigrade and uh, critical pressure of about 74 or bar. Um, it can operate uh, effectively at very high temperatures and uh, pressures. Uh, that's why it uh, really is considered as a working fluid for uh, heat to power applications, uh, uh, a wide range of applications ranging from uh, advanced uh, nuclear reactors to concentrated solar power to uh, uh, heat recovery uh, and, and the conversion to power and so on. But uh, important uh, sort of considerations are the material selection or uh, manufacturing methods and costs and life cycle costs of uh, heat exchangers. Next slide, please. Now, um, if we look at um, the overall cycle design uh, then uh, and the heat exchanger selection, then there are a number of considerations. Uh, first of all, thermal hydraulic considerations that include the uh, overall heat transfer coefficient and, and the uh, heat transfer coefficient of the hot and cold fluids in the heat exchanger, the approach temperature uh, that uh, needs to be as uh, low as possible, uh, the pressure drop in the flow streams, the area density of the heat exchanger, which is the uh, heat transfer area over the volume of the heat exchanger. Again, it has to be as high as possible 
the effectiveness uh, of the heat exchanger, and an important factor, particularly for compact heat exchangers, is the flow distribution in the flow passages. Now, on the other side, um, in terms of material selection and manufacturing uh, considerations, we have the structural integrity of the uh, heat exchanger at high pressures and high temperatures. Uh, if we go above a certain uh, sort of temperature, let's say 550, 600 degrees, then we have to consider uh, uh, oxidation in the heat exchanger, uh, pressure containment, and also thermal expansion of, 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 of the tubes and other materials within the heat exchanger. And all decide the all these decide the life cycle cost. Next slide. Now there are uh, a wide range of um, heat exchanger types for uh, uh, recuperator applications. If we look at the recuperators first, I mean the most common one is the shell and tube uh, heat exchanger that's been around for many 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 years. Uh, here, the uh, for a recuperator, the high pressure fluid will go through the tubes and the lower pressure fluid uh, CO2 will go through the shell. Then we have um, a variation of the shell and tube heat exchanger, which is the uh, plate and shell heat exchanger, where the, um, the high pressure fluid will go through the, uh, through the plates and the lower pressure uh, sort of CO2 will go, go through the shell. We have the spiral, spirally wound heat exchanger that can accommodate uh, expansion uh, in the tubes. And then in a range of uh, very compact uh, heat exchangers, uh, such as the PCHE that we hear later on uh, from uh, more about it from Heatric, and then a, a number of other uh, uh, a compact heat exchangers, such as the microtube, uh, plate matrix, uh, pin fin heat exchangers, and then additive uh, manufacturer heat exchangers. Next slide, please. Now, as um, uh, PCHs will be covered by the by the next uh, sort of presentation, I'm going to say a few more words about the microtube heat exchangers that we're doing some work on at Brunel. Um, the microtube heat exchangers can be used as primary heaters, recuperators, and uh, coolers. Uh, if they are used as recuperators, then it will be quite similar to shell and tube heat exchangers. But here we use very, very uh, small diameter tubes, uh, one millimeter, for example, and, and lower. And then you can see from the graph there that uh, the smaller the diameter of the tube, the higher the surface density uh, of the heat exchanger. Now the table in the slide presents some uh, design parameters for a, a heat exchanger that, is been, that has been developed by TAR Energy as part of the uh, STEP program. And that was a, a kind of a pilot uh, sort of heat exchanger. Now, a variation to the and normally, if we have a shell and tube arrangement, then the high pressure CO2 will go through the tubes, and then the lower pressure CO2 uh, will go through the through the shell, and then we have a cross counter flow arrangement. But the variation to the design is the uh, heat exchanger uh, with separate or plates or sheets that really make the heat exchanger completely counter flow. So one of the fluids uh, with the CO2 high pressure goes through the tubes and then the lower pressure CO2 goes through the uh, through the space between between the tubes and the plates. Next slide. Now here um, I present some um, results of modeling uh, and comparison of the two oh, uh, microtube heat exchangers. Uh, and uh, the results really are from uh, modeling that we've done uh, on the heat exchanger. Uh, uh, where we sort of divide, subdivide the, the heat exchanger into a number of segments uh, that we treat each segment separately and then connecting the se segments together to take into account the variation of the properties of CO2 along the heat exchanger. And this is uh, quite important, really, in particular if we are designing SCO2 heat exchangers. Next slide. Now, here we have some of the results, um, I mean, and, and then really what the Diagrams uh, show that um, the uh, microtube heat exchanger with the separate tubes has um, higher heat transfer uh, uh, coefficients, but at the cost of a high, much higher uh, pressure drop, as you can see on the second diagram on the right hand side. Um, and now, and of course, the higher the flow rate in the heat exchanger, the higher will be the, the pressure drop. And this is a consideration in designing uh, this type of heat exchangers. Next slide, please. 
Now, some other uh, sort of parameters, uh, the effectiveness of the heat exchanger. Again, we can see that uh, really the heat exchanger with the separated tubes uh, has, uh, uh, so, so this the separated plate has uh, a higher sort of heat, uh, effectiveness, at least in the initial sort of sections of the heat exchanger. And of course, the longer the heat exchanger, or, uh, the, then, then the, the effectiveness uh, becomes uh, uh, close to close to one. Uh, and then uh, the, the the other uh, sort of uh, the, the diagram on the right hand side shows the the heat rejection or the heat transfer in the heat exchanger, which again is higher uh, with the separator of sheets. Next slide. Now a little bit on uh, on coolers. Um, I mean coolers have uh, less demanding operating conditions than uh, recuperators. Pressures and temperatures are lower. Again, different types of uh, heat exchangers can be used as the uh, recuperators. Shell and tube, if we are rejecting to water, uh, plate and shell, and uh, also it can have uh, compact heat exchangers. But it's important really for compact heat exchangers to be able to uh, remove the tubes from the shell and clean uh, the shell and the tubes. Or we need to have treatment of water before uh, that water is passed into the, into the heat exchanger. We can also reject uh, to to air, and then of course uh, the presentation later on will present uh, sort of uh, those type of heat exchangers. We can have uh, thin tube heat exchangers as uh, dry coolers, or we can have bare tube heat exchangers as wet coolers, adiabatic coolers, uh, which is a variation of the wet cooler, and again micro tube uh, heat exchangers. Next slide. Now there are uh, design and control considerations uh, with coolers. Um, uh, we need to have uh, effective heat transfer to reduce the footprint and the cost. Again, ideally we want a low approach uh, uh, temperature, low pressure drop, fast response to sudden changes in load. Uh, for example, during emergency shutdown of the power plant, we need to be able to control the conditions entering the, uh, the compressor. So it's important really to have to ensure that uh, control strategies are appropriate uh, to keep the, the conditions going into the compressor or, or constant or as constant as possible, close to the design uh, conditions. And the next uh, slide. So this is a summary slide. PCHGs are well established as recuperators in SCO2 power plant and, 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 other, and other applications, but there are emerging uh, compact designs uh, uh, that um, will take time before they are established commercially for multi-megawatt applications. Um, so the, there are interest, interesting developments in that area. Uh, the selection of the cooler will depend on the availability of water, but also the ambient temperature at the location of the plant. Uh, heat transfer and pressure drop correlations uh, or that we can use for modeling uh, based on a single tube or heat transfer or small sections of heat exchangers. Ideally, really, you want to have data from uh, or multi megawatt uh, uh, type uh, heat exchangers or, uh, and different applications to enable us to validate uh, the heat transfer coefficients and be confident in the design of these heat exchangers. And then wet uh, direct cooling may be a good uh, low life cycle cost option compared to indirect cooling. But again, really, this will depend on the overall design of the system. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Davos. Uh, so the next presentation um, will be the, the heat rig time. We have uh, two speakers, uh, two young engineers. So the first one is uh, Daniel George who is a graduate design engineer at Heatrick with responsibilities covering the thermal design of printed circuit heat exchangers. And the second speaker is, uh, is a lady, uh, it's Natalie Sarpong, uh, who graduated with a master in chemical engineering from the University of Manchester. She is currently a thermal design engineer at Heatrick. So whenever you're ready, please uh, share your screen. Thank you very much, Itka. Uh, thank you very much, Salas, as well. Um, so, um, as I said, um, us at Heatrick, we manufacture and design printed circuit heat exchangers. So we're here to talk a bit about how they're uh, involved in supercritical CO2 power cycles. 
Um, so we're going to start off with a very brief overview on what a PCHE is for anyone uh, who's unaware, go on to their uses and then the associated challenges that we're facing with this and the solutions um, uh, for these. And then finally, we're going to kind of ride out with kind of a, a path to commercialization and the current uh, successes that we've had um, in this kind of sector. OK, so um, in brief, um, a printed circuit heat exchanger um, is uh, basically chemically etched stainless steel plates that are stacked alternatively between a hot side and a cold side and then diffusion bonded together to form a core. Uh, the ancillaries such as the headers, nozzles, supports, etc., are then um, kind of all of them assembled uh, together in the final assembly. And you can kind of see the uh, uh, diagram to the right there uh, displaying uh, kind of a finished unit. Now, the kind of benefits of this um, sort of design um, is the high design temperatures and design pressures that we're able to achieve um, with this. So you can see in the uh, plot in the bottom left, uh, we have design pressures um, just over a thousand bar and design temperatures um, just over uh, 900 uh, degrees Celsius. Um, and obviously this um, makes them quite well suited for supercritical CO2 cycles as Sarah's uh, hinted at earlier. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as Sa uh, Savas uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the main uh, use for um, PCHEs in supercritical CO2 cycles are as recuperators. And as mentioned before, that's kind of where the highest pressures, highest temperatures um, are found here. Um, and as Savas said, um, the recuperators kind of uh, use is there to improve efficiency by using uh, heat uh, from the kind of hotter parts of the process to then heat the cold side. Um, and obviously that improves the efficiency and that's uh, what we're chasing uh, with these cycles. Um, we've also had a little bit of experience um, with some coolers. However, it is very uh, important, especially with uh, PCHEs, for these to be in closed loop systems and not for kind of more open loop uh, systems. And these are for cooling the cycle prior to uh, re-entering uh, the compressor. Now, obviously, the advantages of PCHEs in these um, uh, kind of duties are mainly uh, to do with our uh, size and performance. So to start with our uh, performance, uh, we can achieve um, uh, temperature approaches of down to two degrees. Um, and also um, the associated size um, saving compared to a more traditionally sized um, uh, shell and tube heat exchanger we can see in the uh, diagram there on the left, on the right, sorry. Um, also, alongside the fact with it being a smaller unit, you have the associated um, kind of capital costs um, reduction. Uh, with a smaller heat exchanger, you can have smaller piping, a smaller overall, overall plant, um, things like um, transport, etc., can also be less. Um, and then obviously with that performance increase, you also end up with a, a, an operating cost. Um, saving as well. And last of all, I'll just cover kind of the safety uh, point of view for PCHEs. Um, unlike a shell and tube heat exchanger, we don't have uh, potential for um, uh, kind of pipe rupture or anything like that. So we have less, uh, we don't have the kind of a, that disastrous kind of um, failure mode uh, that you might also um, encounter. So um, you can also see a couple of, um, of our previous units um, in that uh, top right hand corner as well. So the one on the left is a, a recuperator and the one on the right is a cooler. Uh, I'll now pass on to Natalie to talk through some of the challenges we're facing. Sorry about that, I was on mute. Okay, so um, design conditions. So um, design conditions are one of the challenges we perceive in terms of um, supercritical CO2 power. Um, so we see that to get higher efficiencies in these cycles, you want to go for a higher effectiveness design with these heat exchanges. Um, an incremental increase in these uh, effectivenesses increase the air requirements quite significantly. So if you look at our chart on the right, um, 
if you look at about a 0.6 increase in effectiveness, it requires double the area um, requirement for heat chain design. So obviously that really does have an impact on the cost and the financial viability. Um, and therefore there needs to be a trade-off um, looked at there. Um, in addition, uh, when we look at these uh, high temperature and pressure operations, we work in those areas to try again get those cycle efficiencies to be higher um, and when doing so that does increase the stress in the material um, and separate to that we also sometimes look at high temperature spans um, in our heat exchange designs and for similar reasons this increases the, the stresses in the material um, and so that does create mechanical challenges um, and as a basis the maximum design temperature uh, informs the material selection and that goes on to our next challenge challenge in terms of materials so in a, a lot of these cycles again to exploit these high efficiencies we might have to look towards using exotic materials or non-standard components um, so exotic materials for instance if we look at the chart here we have 316 versus 617 um, and you can see that 617 the exotic material has um, a lot more of a high proportion of some of these elements here um, and therefore 316 is richer in the iron ore. Um, so if we look at nickel alone um, we can see that 616, 617 has a lot more nickel in there and nickel is important um, to give the greater high temperature strength that is needed for some of these um, designs at these more extreme design conditions. But this comes at a cost um, and as you can see nickel is multiple magnitudes um, order of magnitudes um, more expensive than iron ore so that has to be considered um, and if we look at 316 alone um, and looking at high temperature uh, operation for just stainless, um, stainless steel 316 um, you see that for um, standard um, schedule pipe sizes, you require thicker components, which is obviously going to be more expensive. Um, and it also does increase the procurement challenges associated with that as well, as you can see in the chart. Um, and all of all, using exotic materials and non-standard components all result in procurement and lead time challenges. Um, Additionally, the complexity, that is another challenge we perceive um, in terms of supercritical CO2 power as we try and squeeze out more potential from these cycles and make them ever more commercially viable. Um, you kind of see things that are more novel and, and more challenging in terms of engineering development, um, which means that things just take a bit longer and it reduces the agility that we can provide to to, to the customer um, and it just means that some of these ideas um, go from the engineering office to start up um, with a, a lot more of a, a lag time between them. Um, so we talked about challenges um, but there are also solutions that people discuss and one solution we do see is modularization. Um, so that would be involving designing smaller components um, that will result in needing smaller uh, smaller modules that will result in needing smaller components um, and these components would likely be you know, thinner and likely be standard sizes which would greatly reduce the cost of these components and they will be easier to procure as standard schedule sizes and, and thicknesses. Um, additionally um, designing smaller modules may reduce the actual complexity in designing itself um, which could mean that slightly less engineering time is needed. Um, and it also means that we can improve our control capabilities and our downtime capabilities, and you can switch exchanges off um, multiple or modules in the full module system, um, which is beneficial um, for us here. Um, now I'm going to hand over back to Dan to speak on where we are now. So yeah, thank you, Natalie. So, um, Kind of looking forward to the future and our kind of uh, successes so far. Uh, the main big success is with uh, MAN and their ETES system. Uh, they've uh, in the last year or so they've uh, had the plant up and running in Denmark, and that's a supercritical CO2 cycle that's using um, uh, renewable energy um, and also has a, a storage um, to that energy in, in that cycle as well. Uh, we've also supplied units for the step demo plant 
uh, which is uh, kind of part of the Department of Energy and GTI, and we've had unit um, go off uh, for that. And finally, um, with cool heat, um, we've been involved in that project using uh, waste heat from industry uh, to kind of be the heat source for uh, a supercritical CO2 cycle. So uh, that's um, everything from myself and Natalie. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anseli and Daniel. So it's the third presentation that is still waiting for us. Uh, so I would like to uh, invite uh, Xavier Guerif uh, to the stage. Uh, Xavier is the R&D director of Calvian Thermal Solutions since 2012. However, he joined Calvian already in 2007 as a project manager for air fin cooler and air cooler condenser. Previously, he worked for Alstom and was in charge of thermodynamic design of steam turbine and auxiliaries. So Xavier, whenever you are ready, please share your screen. Okay. Yes, yes, we see 12, it's thank okay. you. Yes, it is. So good afternoon. Uh, I will present you what has been developed during the Scarbus project to improve the performance of uh, dry air coolers. Try to. So here are the main topic of my presentation. First, a few words about thermal Kelvin, uh, Kelvin thermal solution. Then a brief description about uh, what is an air fin coolers and what kind of enhancement is possible on air uh, on fin tubes. Uh, then I will present you what are the associated challenge and what kind of test has been done in order to try to solve them. Uh, and finally, uh, I will conclude with uh, what uh, could be the savings uh, of this kind of uh, improvement on uh, large scale units. So, Kelvin Thermal Solution is a quite old company uh, founded in 1920. Uh, as you can see on, on this slide, uh, the company has a quite large portfolio. Um, you will notice that there is two types of uh, dry air coolers. There is what we call the air cool condenser. Uh, which is a condenser with an A-shaped structure, such a way that fin tubes are 60 degrees inclined. This is a neat exchanger which is used for condensation of steam under vacuum. So it's not the one we will use for condensation of CO2. Uh, we are using air fin coolers, which is more appropriated for higher pressure. So first question we can raise is uh, why we can use an air fin coolers uh, on, uh, on uh, the Scarabus project. In fact, this is because one of the targets of the project is to use CO2 with a blend, such a way that we increase uh, the critical pressure. And so the temperature of condensation of the CO2 blend is increased also, such a way that, in fact, the temperature difference with the air uh, ambient temperature allow a full condensation uh, of the CO2. So an air fin cooler is, is composed of one or several bundles supported by a steel structures. A fan and drive system feeds the bundles with air fresh in order to cool down um, the fin tubes uh, and inside the fin tube, so we call down also uh, the CO2 or the CO2 blended, in fact. Uh, variable uh, frequency drive can be used to regulate the fan speed and so the airflow, but louvers can be used also for the same purpose. The bundle is composed of headers. Uh, the headers are used for distribution of the CO2 blend inside the fin tubes, and bundle frames are used in order to support headers and, uh, and fin tubes. 
So the, the core of the air fin coolers are the fin tubes where uh, the heat exchange occurs, in fact. And this is really the, the, the component where we can play in order to try to improve the efficiency of the air fin coolers. So on the left part of this slide, you can see uh, a typical fin tube, which is used uh, on the market. Um, we call it extruded fin tubes. So this tube is composed of a plain tubes with an aluminum sleeve for protection against corrosion and with aluminum smooth fins. In order to improve the efficiency of these fin tubes, it is possible to add some structure inside the tubes, but also on air side on the external fins, for example, by adding this groove. Um, what, what, what is uh, important is to consider that when we add such structures, we not only increase uh, the heat transfer, but we also uh, increase the pressure losses. So this kind of geometry, this kind of structure has been optimized such a way to find the best compromise. So the rest of my presentation will deal uh, much more with the inner improvement, the inner structure of the tubes. Uh, it exists several kinds of structures, for example, herring bone fins or microstructures. Uh, the best compromise in terms of thermal efficiency and pressure losses is to use helicoidal fins inside the tubes. So the, um, the, the role of the helicoidal fins is to modify the boundary layers between the fluids and between the tubes. The performance of these fins is depending on four parameters. First, the fin numbers, the fin height, the fin thickness, but also the fin helix angle. And what is also interesting to note is that uh, this fin efficiency for the same geometry is also depending of the, fin, um, of the tube's diameter, but also the, the fluid properties. In literature, there is several articles dealing with uh, helicoidal fins, uh, but most of them are limited with tube diameter between 3 millimeters and 15 millimeters. Few of them are dealing with CO2 uh, condensation, and none of them with blended CO2. And what, what we have to consider is that for a full-scale installation for supercritical CO2, in fact, we will deal with high, air flow, high mass flow, in fact. And with such uh, mass flow, in fact, the most economical solution is to use one-inch tubes. Using smaller tubes will generate much more uh, pressure losses. And also, the manufacturing of fin tube with smaller tubes will be much more expensive, mainly because we will use much more tubes, in fact, at least 15% more than with one-inch tubes. Uh, and, and that is for that reason, due to the fact that in literature there is no data about one inch tubes, and uh, because there is no data with uh, the blended CO2, that we have decided in the Scarabus project to make some tests uh, with some optimized helicoidal geometry uh, in order to define the thermal and hydraulic correlation for one inch tubes. And this test has been done with the support of our partner TUW uh, in Vienna. So in order to, to quantify what would be the improvement with, the, with this inner structure, in fact, we have manufactured three different test sections. One with a plain tube inside, uh, and it is used for reference. Another one with a dedicated geometry for the cooling of CO2. Another one uh, for the uh, uh, condensation uh, of CO2 with another geometry. You can see on the bottom of this slide, two uh, photos of the, these tube test sections. So the, the two tube test sections are composed of two concentric tubes. 
the inner one uh, where the blended CO2 circulates and the outer one where water cooling circulates in counterflow. All along the, the length of this tube test section, we have installed uh, some uh, temperature sensor, such a way to divide the full length in three parts. And for each part, then we are able to calculate what is the thermal power. And also, thanks to some wall temperature measurement, we are then able to calculate also the local heat transfer coefficient and, and so to, to make the improvement between uh, plain tubes and uh, the inner improvement. So here are some, some results. Uh, so first, first step of, uh, of uh, our analysis was to check uh, the validity of our measurement. Um, so you can see on the right graphic, uh, some comparison with experimental data for different max flux for uh, one inch tubes and for condensation of uh, blend CO2. And you can see that uh, the experimental data regarding the heat transfer fit very well with uh, the, the correlation from Cavellini corrected by Bell Galli. In fact, you see that the discrepancy is less than 10%. Our measurements have also shown that this improvement ratio between plain tubes and uh, the, the tubes with inner fins is depending on the vapor content and also the mass flux inside the tubes. Some measurements have shown some interesting improvement. Uh, we are able to improve the heat transfer coefficient by 40% uh, and with a pressure drop increase of, of 50%. So next step was is, is to check with not only a single tubes but a small heat exchanger. So a small heat exchanger has been manufactured uh, with four row, four passes. Uh, first row dedicated to cooling of CO2, and the three last row dedicated to condensation of CO2. Uh, this uh, you see in the picture this uh, small heat exchanger installed in the testing of TUW. Uh, and this uh, changer will be tested uh, in 2023. I will conclude my, my presentation with, uh, with, uh, with what kind of savings we can do on a full scale installation. Uh, in this table, you see um, a comparison between a standard AFC with typical fins, extruded fins, and uh, uh, with an AFC with uh, the new technology with inner fins and with groovy fins on air sites. Calculation have been done for a total duty of 235 uh, megawatts. And even uh, if the, the, the design of the bay uh, is the same for the, 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 the two case here, as I mean, uh, 18 meter long and 413 uh, tubes per bundle, you can notice that the number of bay used uh, with uh, uh, enhancement of tubes is much smaller. So we can save 16%. And so it's result, it results in the savings on the capex of about 23%. Uh, what is also interesting uh, to notice is that we have also a saving regarding the electrical fan consumptions uh, by approximately 6%. So to conclude, in fact, the combination of this inner fins and the groovy fins on air side uh, is very interesting, not only to, 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 to save some, some, some cost to reduce the plot plant, but also uh, to uh, reduce the carbon footprint. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, so this is it, uh, three presentations. Uh, we are hoping that uh, the takeaways are great from, from all three. We are not yet done, but we are quite close to being done. Uh, so before we conclude by the, the Q&A session, I still have one Slido question. So I will again uh, share my screen. Please, if you don't see it, <laughs> tell me. <laughs> the QR code should be the same. Can you see my screen, the Slido coming? 
Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I'm lucky. And you too. <laughs> so this is a different question. The, uh, the question is, why do you think that the heat exchangers and SCO2 cycles can improve most for the future? So you have five options and it's uh, it's kind of a rating poll. So ideally, you should do the rating uh, or the, the ranking of all the five options uh, according to your preference or yeah, so the first one is the, the one that you think that there is the most um, uh, most need for improvement uh, and the fifth one, the least, of course. And we put also the other, if you want, uh, you can put in the chat what you mean by the other, because this is not possible via Slido. Uh, we still have a few people typing, but uh, maybe we can already debrief. Uh, Daniel, would you like to join me on the stage uh, to say a few words about the results? OK, yes. Yeah. So uh, thank you for everyone providing their answers here. So as you can see, kind of price is kind of the overwhelming kind of <laughs> leader there. And obviously, um, that's always something that people are uh, concerned of but as kind of we've all spoken about with uh, the temperatures and pressures we're working with and the kind of materials we're pushed to price is something we're kind of pushing against with the current um, uh, supply chain and kind of logistics challenges there um, obviously the materials uh, that's all kind of tied in there and then obviously size is also um, quite high up in terms of the ranking here with the overall plant size and um, overall kind of um, effectiveness we're looking at kind of more compact units is more favorable um in this as well and then kind of at the end you've kind of got a lead time um here i suppose where uh still kind of in some of these projects still in the early stages it's less of a um kind of pushing uh kind of force at the moment though i'm sure that will uh, become more important um as we move forward with this Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll try to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, I took some um, some screenshot of also all the the questions. I'm not sure. Maybe in the meantime they have been already answered, but they are both for heat break. So uh, uh, Daniel and uh, Natalie, uh, have you already answered these questions from the chat or not yet? Maybe we can stay with me. <laughs> but I think we uh, should hand over to someone who's a bit more knowledgeable on all of that. So, oh, I'll, for so I'll many <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's Carrie Swinner here. Um, Hello. Yeah, basically, those are very interesting questions, and those questions are always asked. Um, however, for me, I need maybe to highlight two things with regards to the idea of temperature ramp up. It is true that we want to get a much faster cycle, but one of the things that we have found is it's not necessarily just about the temperature ramp up of the recuperator, for example. It's usually the whole system response. So you're not just looking at the heat exchanger, you're looking at uh, the turbine, you're talking about the compressor, you're talking about the response as well on the pipe work. What we have found is that you can be extremely aggressive with the PCHE in terms of ramp up because quite often in the SCO2 cycle, given the combination of pressure and temperatures, and obviously, as Daniel was explaining, we're trying to achieve higher efficiency, so we're trying to ramp up the temperatures. Uh, you'll find that there is quite a uh, quite an important thermal mass in the PCHE. So what you'll find is that even if you were to go quite aggressive in terms of the inlet CO2 temperature increase, 
uh, there will be a soaking up happening within the PCHE. So in fact, the PCHE will uh, tend to slow down things simply because there will be that temperature soak up inside the PCHE. Uh, that's why the, all the discussion we've had so far on the various projects, so for example, the step is certainly one people uh, are very keen. I myself was lucky to be in San Antonio last week, so I was literally next to those heat exchangers. Uh, and we all agreed that it's actually a question of not knowing yet how the whole system behaves. And therefore, even though you think you're pushing the temperature very aggressively in your cycle, there will be a resistance and therefore uh, the PCHE will not suffer any kind of catastrophic uh, ramp up. So it's not answering about a degree per C per minute simply because that's not the right question to ask. I think the right question to ask is how fast can we push the system in terms of residence? And then in principle, from what we've seen so far, the PCHE should not be limited. Obviously, we're talking about the recuperator and the cooler here. Uh, I know that the next session will be talking about the wasted recovery unit, and this wasted recovery unit will be certainly exposed to much higher stress uh, when you're talking about ramping up uh, the temperature. And as a matter of fact, uh, what you'll find is in terms of mitigating the potential failure of the wasted recovery and therefore the whole SCA2 system, a lot of people are talking about having that wasted recovery unit preheated beforehand. That would be one of the, uh, as, uh, basically one of the strategy to try to get a much faster uh, startup. For the second question, oh, and yeah, uh, yeah, what is meant by the effectiveness metric uh, in the UA versus effectiveness graph? Well, the effectiveness is uh, the amount of heat you can recover from the total theoretical heat. So if you're considering a heat exchanger, if you're considering that you're going to have a hot inlet and a hot outlet and a cold inlet and a cold outlet, the maximum theoretical heat will be the hot inlet minus the cold outlet. And then you just uh, divide in that value uh, by uh, one of the stream, either the temperature difference between the hot stream or the cold stream. So it's the theoretical amount of heat you can recover within the heat exchanger. So there is, it's basically a figureless uh, value. And uh, this is how you try to explain the maximum efficiency of your heat exchanger uh, versus the US. So what was being explained uh, earlier is that the higher the effectiveness, the more surface area, and indeed it is associated with the LMTD, the logarithmic mean temperature difference. So it's the inverse of the LMTD, whereby the higher the effectiveness, the more expansion the requirement for surface area. That's why you see this curve inflection. And this curve actually that Natalie was showing has been extrapolated from a lot of studies we've done on the SCO2 cycle. So what you'll find is that up to 0.9% effectiveness, you get a relatively linear behavior in terms of surface area requirement to effectiveness. When you're getting closer to the 0.94% effectiveness, that's when you start to see that inflection, which goes exponentially after the 0.95, 0.96, to try to actually bring a, a more explanation. And I realize in the interest of time, I'm going to go even faster for the temperature difference between fluids. Right, this question is a very interesting one. What you'll find is it's associated with two factors. First, where you are in terms of design material strength. And the second thing is how aggressive you want to be with your cycle. Obviously, the larger temperature difference, the smaller the heat exchanger. So you're thinking you're saving in cost, but in doing so, you're introducing very high thermal stresses. So the way we're going to say, and we don't necessarily have a value because it depends on many aspects. First and foremost, the fluid that you're using. And secondly, the way that you're actually going to design your heat exchanger in terms of a geometry. Are you going to make it long and tall? Are you going to make it wide and small? There's plenty of different aspects depending on the processes. But one thing is true is that when you're going to be at the lower temperature range, you certainly can consider a much more aggressive temperature difference. But when you're talking about uh, more like, let's say, recuperator, let's say, for example, the high temperature recovery for the step facility, which is a 600 degrees here, 290 bar design, you really, really want to get the closest temperature approach so that you can reduce the thermal stresses. What we tend to advise for PCHEs, but that's not uh, any guidelines, that's just an advice, and it depends how you want to operate, is that yeah, if you can stay within 20 degrees, for example, when you're pushing your material design strength between uh, 20 degrees between stream, that should be okay. Uh, but if you're certainly considering, we've got some people who come to talk to us about 300 degrees C temperature difference between stream uh, at the hot end, no. Obviously, that would be well excessive. So there's no direct answer. It's more a question of every cycle is unique. And the last point I would add with regards to the cost, 
I think we have to be honest with ourselves right now. The SEO2 cycle is not commercialized. The closest, which is very much a very good work of man with their district heating, is certainly bring it uh, to commercialization. The process condition of the man are obviously not as aggressive as an RCPC that we can see. Uh, and therefore, right now, I think the main issue for the cost will remain the fact that there still needs to be standardization, modularization of your system. And that's the way to reduce the cost of the equipment, certainly. I hope I sort of answered without necessarily giving you figures. I realize a lot of people were begging for figures. Everybody asks us for those, but that's the best answer we can give right now. Of course, feel free to contact us. And maybe we can have a closer discussion on one-to-one -one with the people. Thank you very much, Renaud, for uh, this exhausting, uh, uh, exhaustive, <laughs> exhaustive answer. Thank you so much. Thank you for stepping up. Um, we still have some time, I think, while well, we are a little bit over time, but if you, I mean, I know that our speakers are available for your questions, so if you have the time, you can still stay with us, because I'm sure that they will be happy to answer the other questions. So, um, I would like to invite speakers to have a look in the chat, because, uh, yeah, there were some yeah. more questions well, coming up while I was sharing the screen. Yeah, I think there is, a, there is a question. Yes, I think there is a question from Marcus Offer related to uh, if the main resistance is on the air side. Um, so, so typically, yes, to, to add some uh, groove on the external fins, it's helped to reduce uh, the resistance on, on the air side. But for search application, in fact, the, as a, let's say the sharing between the resistance on air side and tube side, and tube side is, is quite quite good because in fact it is nearly 60% air side and 40% tube side. So that means that uh, enhancement on air side and on internal side makes sense. In fact, uh, it would be totally different for a steam condenser, for example, where. Uh, uh, the main resistance uh, is on uh, air side for sure. Uh, and so the internal improvement will will uh, will not be uh, interesting, but for this application, yes, uh, the sharing uh, between the resistance air side and tube side is quite good. That there is another another question from Dinesh about uh, separation of fluids. So yes. Um, Typically, uh, with plain tubes, uh, we have more risk to, to face this separation of, of fluids. One, one interesting fact to have this uh, inner fins also is that it, 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 uh, it creates some, uh, some um, let's say, additional turbulence and, and it, uh, it helps uh, to, to maintain an homogeneous uh, between uh, between the two components, um, but I I'm, I cannot say 100%. I cannot be 100% sure that during transient operation we we will uh, we will uh, we, we we will have no separation. Uh, but but during let's say a continuous uh, operation. We stabilize operation. Uh, yes, for sure, this uh, inner fins uh, uh, helps to, to maintain this homogeneous picture. Uh, okay, and, and then I can see there is one last question with regards to the values of temperature and pressures for quick test. Well, the very principle of the diffusion bonding and the way we qualified it is that we're getting what we call parent material properties, which means that we are getting the very same property of the material as per the ASME code. So in terms of the crypt test, we've done certainly some tests. What we found is that because we get exactly the same as a prime metal property, we can then confer back to the ASME uh, two uh, tables and we can then just design for life on that basis with regards to uh, stresses versus the design, material design strength. Thank you. I see that there is another question, which I think wasn't covered, but I'm not sure for which speaker it is. It's from Jaime, and it says, uh, what's the main application of blended CO2 with refrigerants? As CO2 power generation or as CO2 conventional refrigeration? 
<laughs> Honestly, I, 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 I don't know what is the biggest market for that. Um, I don't know. Xavier, do you need to precise the question? Maybe, Jaime, if, if you are still here, you could precise a little bit more your question. When uh, I'm also from Kelvion Thermal Solutions, and when I um, read the question, um, my my interpretation was, um, or I think the right answer is that that the addition of the extra components in the CO2 uh, is, like Xavier said, to increase um, the critical temperature and also the um, uh, the condensation temperature, which is very helpful in hot climates to to increase the condensation temperatures a bit and to to improve the supercritical CO2 power cycle for um, concentrated solar power. I think that was also the goal of the um, of the Scarabaeus project. Exactly, but which one will be the, the biggest market between uh, supercritical cycle and, and refrigeration? I don't, I don't know. Yeah, and also whether you want to express it in number or money. Yes. <laughs> I can also see another question from Matthias uh, for heat trick. Uh, is it beneficial to use PCHEs with internal headers for SCO2 cycles? Um, short answer is it, it can be yes. Um, basically, you've got to think about um, with PCHE, the aim is to kind of have as a compact kind of unit as possible. Um, and obviously, if you're um, using part of the unit uh, to be kind of an internal header, you're not using that area. Uh, for heat transfer. So um, in terms of um, cost of a unit and the overall size of a unit, it's kind of on a case by case basis in designing on looking if it is worthwhile looking into those internal headers um, or, or, or not in that case. Uh, often we find we're kind of like smaller units. Sometimes uh, you're sacrificing quite a lot of that um, kind of heat transfer area. So it's not always um, as beneficial as it, as it could be. There's one more question from Dinesh at the bottom. I'm not sure for whom this question is. Uh, Dinesh, can you maybe precise who would you, who would you like to ask? Uh, yeah, it's it's actually addressed to uh, Xavier, and um, it's about the CO2 blend-based systems, and mm -hmm. particularly talking like when we are trying to squeeze more uh, recuperation, and we can go into the regime of like some liquefaction right, um, within the recuperator itself. Um, but then, in, when it comes to heat exchanger design, like uh, how uh, is that? What are all the limitations that uh, needs to be watched out? And if you can comment on that. Um, you, you are talking about the fact that in, in the recuperator, we will have uh, cooling of supercritical CO2 plus condensation uh, of a part of the component? Yes, that's correct. OK. Um, so in the, in in most of cases we 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 try to to uh, to avoid the par partial uh, condensation, but in this case uh, uh, when we use this blend, the, the 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 composition of the blend is is very small compared to the CO2 blend, so it it's possible. I think uh, also Salas here. I think uh, really uh, in effect we can use those type of heat exchangers for as a condenser. So I don't think uh, a really a small uh, amount of uh, of um, sort of vapor uh, would affect, provided uh, really you don't have much liquid going into the into the sort of to enter the compressor. Then I don't think that's 
should be a big problem. Okay, yeah, uh, it's, it's yeah. Thanks for that. And it's really about like in terms of mal distribution and all. Uh, will that be any concern? Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh, in in fact, um, there is quite often some mal distribution mainly when uh, you enter an it exchangers where uh, when you you are not only gas where, where you are at the entrance already some 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 vapor content and liquid content uh, in this case you will enter the heat exchangers uh, in gas condition and then only we will have a, a partial condition con uh, uh, liquefaction at, at the very end of the uh, of the heat exchangers so it's it's not really an issue Okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't see any any other written questions, but maybe somebody would like to ask a, a normal question orally without writing it down. So if it is if it's the case, just take the floor. Yes, Stefan, please. Yes, maybe I can raise one question. Um, for this uh, printer certificate heat exchangers, what's, let's say, a reasonable maximum size of these um, heat exchangers? I mean, I know they are somehow limited in size. And um, if we are looking on, let's say, larger, uh, larger systems, um, the um, the recuperated heat um, yeah is exceeding I would say the design limit for 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 this for this for this technology. What's in your opinion the um, the reasonable the the reasonable maximum size of such a system? Hi Stefan, it's Reno. So I'm Hi. gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> okay, I'm gonna answer to you. Um, so first and foremost, if you think about the step high temperature recuperator, it's a 50 megawatt thermal. 50. 50, 50 five zero. Okay. To give you some idea. Mm -hmm. So you're already talking about quite a large thermal unit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the printed circuit heat exchanger can be made. The longest we've ever made was 8.5 meter long, mm -hmm. uh, but that was obviously a conventional gas cooler. Uh, the real there's you see there are two aspects to take into consideration. First, obviously, there will be how do you actually install it in your system, and what you'll find is some of the limiting factor uh, will be first the the process you're going to put in it. So, for example, what kind of temperature span do you want to go through your high temp your temperature your mm -hmm. recuperator? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the longer the temperature span, the more the thermal stress is, and that means that you're going to start to have some interesting issues about bending and warping of the exchangers by those temperature differences. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what some of the things you have to consider. If you were to do, uh, I would say, a conventional gas cooler, uh, so you know those kind of temperatures are usually the 150 to maybe the 175 degrees C for the gas with water on the other side, mm -hmm. you could go in much longer than that. But you'll find that when you're talking about elevated temperatures, and that's one of the very, very interesting points. A lot of people are thinking about, well, if I combine pressure and temperatures, that's going to make that exchanger suffering a lot. But it's not so much about the combination of pressure and temperature. As a matter of fact, at these kind of temperatures, it is the thermal stresses that really, really dictate your design. And even more so the fact that you need to bring high pressure, high temperature fluid inside that exchanger. So you'll find that the associated nozzle loads that, are, that, that you've got to manage becomes extremely tricky in addition to the thermal stresses associated with the distortion. So the HDR, this 50 megawatt thermal unit is 43.3 tons. And I think it's about uh, something like close to six meter long, okay? So what I would say, and that's why Daniel was rightly pointed at the fact that if you're really serious about looking at these kind of cycles, because everybody at one stage was thinking about, can I have one recuperator? Well, I'm thinking about if you're going for one recuperator, you're going to have to bring the fluid to that recuperator. And that's why Daniel showed that interesting graph, uh, which is that measurements of pipe thickness for diameters. 
<coughs> when you're going to talk about a very large flow rate and you want to have a single exchanger, you're going to have a massive pipe with extremely thick wall thickness. I can tell you the nozzle loads there are going to basically crush everything. Mm -hmm. So what you find is that if you want to make these cycles viable, you need, in fact, to go for minimizing the size of your nozzles in order to minimize the size of the loads. And that means, unfortunately, you're going to have to go for limiting the overall size of your heat exchanger to make it financially viable or even remotely technically viable. That's the things that we've learned mostly. Mm. So I'm not sure I answer everything the way you want, but hopefully I give you a picture. It, yeah, yeah. It's very Thank much, you. It's, a, it's a case by case basis. Yeah, yeah, to be yeah sure. With you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? All right, there is none. You can always write to us and uh, we'll make sure that we find someone who will answer it. So before we call this a day, uh, before you disconnect, please let me thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, we are very happy that um, that so many of you find the time to come. Thank you so much for your interest and for your engagement. Uh, we really enjoyed this session and we'll be happy if you join us next time. So next time we still stay with the component challenges. We still stay with heat exchanger, but next time we'll talk about primary heaters. So once we are done with the date, uh, we will definitely write you an email like we did before and we will invite you so you will not definitely miss it and uh, of course uh, once we process the presentations and edit the video you will also get uh, an email with uh, with the proceedings of this webinar so thank you very much uh, have a nice evening and we hope to see you next time thank you very much